Okay, everyone. Um, yeah, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. This is uh, Maud Gilson uh, from FX Street. Uh, I have to tell you, and I'm sorry about this, that my colleague Gonzalo Moreira, who is the host of this webinar, who has been uh, presenting all the webinars in this series of the Traders Bookshelf, is uh, sick and he's unable to be with us today. Um, it's a last minute um, change, so we uh, have kept the, 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 the event for today. Uh, even if Gonzalo was not able to be with us, um, because um, well, it's it's not that easy to find uh, a, a moment with uh, John in his busy agenda, and then it's the same for Gonzalo. And I prefer not to reschedule, so everyone I had uh, to make it again, including you, uh, the attendees. Uh, so. Uh, Gonzalo usually does a small and short introduction about the book. Um, I will, uh, honestly, I haven't read the book, so I'm unable to talk about it. Um, you can see on my screen the page of the book on FX Street. It's a book that um, we decided to uh, introduce in, in our list of books on FX Street, where uh, we uh, have a selection of uh, the books that um, we consider to be of high quality for the traders. Um, John came to us with uh, his ebook a few weeks or month ago. Uh, Gonzalo uh, looked at it, studied it, and found it very uh, interesting and very practical for the traders. So um, that's why we included here. Uh, the, the ebook in our list. Um, I will uh, let John talk about the content of this book um, and how you can uh, take profit of, of what it's uh, inside this report. It's more than, than a book, it's more of a report of studies that can help you in your daily trading. Um, John will talk for about 20 minutes, 25 minutes about the book. When the presentation is over, he will take your questions. So you might have questions about the content of the book, about his career, about uh, his uh, trading um, strategies. So you're welcome to make the questions at the end of this session. So that's it for me. Sorry again for the last change minute. We hope Gonzalo will be fine soon and uh, I'll let uh, John take the mic and, and talk to you. Thank you. Okay, um, yeah, like Maud said, the this is more of a report than it is a book. Uh, it's something that developed out of some experience I had uh, looking at and trading some Forex patterns. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background about me, uh, I started in the Forex market in the late 90s. I was working for what was then a division of Thompson Financial known as Technical Data, um, which after a couple of different name changes became IFR Markets. And then Thompson Financial merged with Thompson Reuters. So the IFR Markets thing ended up becoming part of what is now Thompson Reuters. Um, along with Forex, I also did uh, fixed income. I covered some, some equity market stuff. I even did some energy markets and the commodities as well. But primarily I was a Forex analyst. And most of the work that I did was concentrated on real-time analysis. You know, we, we wrote, um, for immediate distribution, reactions to news, what we were seeing on the technical charts in today, longer term stuff as well that we mixed in, because you, you know how trading days go. They don't, they're not always the most exciting things in the world on, you know, on a minute to minute, hour by hour basis. But basically what I was, was a strategist. I came up with ideas that you know I thought the readers would find interesting you know, and profitable, or at least something that they could do to, to get a different perspective on trading. Um, I have actually for the last, Two years now, I've been working on my PhD, focusing on um, what was broadly behavioral finance, but most specifically is looking at the profit and performance of individual retail forex traders. So, what I've been doing a lot of research on lately has been what you know what impacts their month-to-month -month returns and that sort of thing. But obviously, in the context of foreign exchange, this report is something that I first put together 
back in, I think it was the end of 2005, beginning of 2006, I, in my own training, I'd kind of observed a pattern in one of the Euro crosses where it, you know, during one particular month of the year, it had gone up every single year since the Euro had been launched. I said, okay, that's kind of strange. Uh, you don't normally expect to, to see, you know, that sort of pattern in, in the Forex market, which is by a lot of people is considered to be one of the more efficient ones out there because of how many participants are, how narrow the market is in terms of the number of pairs that get traded and all that. And I was able to trade it quite profitably that year. And that kind of got me thinking, well, let me take a look and see. Maybe there are some other patterns, maybe one or two here or there. And so, you know, I ran all sorts of numbers and, and looked at it a bunch of different ways. And I was quite surprised to find that, you know, that one pattern that I had traded wasn't the only one out there. There were a bunch of them. Some obviously much more significant and, and meaningful than others. And there's a lot of places where there are no patterns, but that research ended up becoming the first edition of this report that I, I kind of put together in 06. And I've done a couple of, of updates and upgrades to it since then, expanded the content, expanded the the pairs and the and the, the kind of the breadth of what I'm looking at. So now we get to this point where it's looking at, I think, 26, 27 total instruments in four different ways. Um, so, you know, there's more to it, but um, that was kind of the introduction and, and what I'll do from here in the presentation is kind of take you through what the, the report's about and how it can be useful to you. So, you know, that said, like I said, yes, there really are seasonal patterns of Forex and they're persistent. You know, one of the things that I did observe in doing this report a few times now is that the patterns that I was seeing in the original report are still there. Some of them have gotten even stronger. Uh, you know, some have faded a little bit, but there are still a lot of very good patterns in the Forex market. And I, I'm not going to claim that I'm going to be, you know, an expert in, in saying why these patterns exist. Some of them are, you, you can probably come up with some pretty good reasons for it in terms of when they fall on the calendar and, and what mo might motivate them. But the fact that they are there tells you that there is some fundamental reason for why this stuff happens. They don't happen every year, um, that's for sure. But they happen often enough that you, you figure there's got to be some underlying flow of capital, of trade, of whatever that's driving them. So without further ado, let me get into what I did. All right, starting with the data. The All the exchange rates that I used was taken from Reuters. Uh, Reuters uses uh, the New York close to be the end of day. So in any sort of daily sort of work in, in this report, the end of day is considered the New York close from that perspective. Uh, the data that I've got goes back to 1982 for all the majors, except for the euro, obviously, which didn't exist at that point. For the euro, what, what Reuters has done is they've backfilled into 1997 using the old ECU, the European Currency Unit, which was the, the basket precursor to the euro and was what the euro was set at when it was first launched in January 1st of 1999. Uh, I did calculated crosses for everything because uh, Reuters does not have uh, data going back on the crosses all the way back. It, it, it stops, you know, at various points. So in order to be consistent, um, the, I felt the need that I had to do all the calculated crosses. Um, and, and that obviously goes back to 82 for all the majors where I got that data and then back to 97 for the Euro crosses. Um, and oops, go. I also calculated a set of currency indices, uh, kind of like the idea behind the dollar index, except instead of doing a trade weight, I just did an equal weight. So each currency index, and I covered all the majors, was an equal weight of how a currency on a given day performed against the other set of majors. So, so just you know, the U.S. against the euro, the yen. The, uh, Sterling, the Swiss, Canada, and the Aussie. How did it? How did each one of those pairs do? And then just average that out, and that gets you change on the day for the index. So very simple. Just try to get an idea above and beyond the pattern of the pairs themselves, what the currency was doing, um, and kind of on a broad index. So that's uh, just you know one more little bit of depth to it. That's all. Um, in terms of how I looked at it, it was a couple of different ways. Uh, the, the first one and, you know, kind of really easy one to do was just looking at weekdays. You know, how does, how does a given pair 
trade on Monday or trade on Tuesday, whatever. I also looked at things monthly and, and there's been a lot of, you know, seasonal research in, in Forex and also in other markets that looked at monthly patterns. You know, how does, how does a currency do in December? How does it do in August? You know, that sort of thing. So I did that. Uh, out of curiosity, I also did, because there are monthly patterns and they're tiny little weekday patterns in some cases, I decided to take a look at it just to see if there were any days during given months, weekdays during given months that there might be something worth looking at, um, kind of anomalies in, in a lot of ways. And then finally, because there are or, or kind of overlaps in how things trade on a month to month sort of basis. Um, and because months themselves, just because they are, you know, they, they fall by the calendar and, you know, our X number of days are fixed and all that. Uh, I, I decided to use kind of a, a rolling week to week sort of thing where I counted from the beginning of the year. Every seven days was one week. So January 1st to January 7th is week number one. January 8th to January 14th is week number two and on and so on. So you get 52 in a fraction weeks over the course of the year. And so I looked at returns for each one of those, of those periods. Uh, and I looked at it in three different ways. One is just one week holding period, uh, two week holding period, and then a, a one month holding period. So if at any point in week one, you were to go long, what would your return be one week forward, two weeks forward, one month forward? The interestingly, or, or perhaps expectedly, the, the, better, the better patterns are in the longer holding periods, which fits in with some of what we see in the monthly data and, and is reflective of the, the influence of fundamental factors, which obviously makes sense based on what I was talking about before. Um, I looked at, I, I did two different, ways of looking at you know these patterns one was frequency so how often did a, a currency index or a pair go up or down in that given time so in april how many how many months since 1982 has the cable gone up versus gone down uh, so just a straight count and then you get you know a, a balance and the other thing i looked at was amplitude to get an idea of the size of moves so on average, what percentage move was seen in the month of April for cable, for example. And, and putting those two together, you get an idea of what the stronger patterns are and the weaker patterns are. Because sometimes you get what looks like a very good kind of pattern on a return side, on the amplitude side, where there's a big average percentage move. But it may be kind of a 50-50 sort of split in terms of frequency, so there's no real clear pattern, which indicates there might be the influence of some, you know, really big month in the data somewhere along the way. And the other way, flipping it around as well, sometimes you get a relatively high frequency for a move in a pair, but the average move is not so big. So, you, you know, you ideally want to look for the patterns where you get a good frequency and a good amplitude, and those, those tell you those are going to be the strong ones. All right, now, just to give you an idea of, of some of the patterns that I did find, and I can't be comprehensive here because it would just, you know, webinar would go on for quite a long time. Um, I just picked out four examples using the different uh, methodologies that I was just talking about. All right, the first one is just a straight weekday pattern. And like I said, there's, there's not a lot to the weekday stuff, and which is kind of what you'd expect. The, the one place where I found something that is, is technically significant is these Fridays. Uh, for the for the Canadian dollar, looking at the index here, you can see there's a slight positive bias on Fridays. 52.3 percent of the time, uh, the index has been higher. The, the, the Canadian dollar has been higher against the other. Against 47.6 percent, it's been lower. Uh, not a real strong thing, and probably not something you're really going to do much in terms of trading, unless you're maybe an algo and you you just want to do some really high frequency sort of stuff. Uh, and throw in some statistical anomalies as part of it. Uh, this was just more to kind of baseline things and say, okay, well, this is what we kind of expected. You know, uh, things happen at various points, different the way the data gets released. The one thing you could say might influence this is that Fridays are the days when things like non-farm payrolls gets reported, so that might have a, a bigger influence on the market and that sort of thing. But otherwise, not much in the weekdays that you're you're going to see. But I included them there just you know to be thorough and comprehensive. 
Secondly, uh, the monthly pattern. In this case, I'm looking at euro dollar, and you've got a couple of, of meaningful things in here. Right at the top of, the, of this table, you can see January, where you've got a 35, 65 split in terms of January is not being a very good month for, for the euro with a, an average change that's the amplitude thing of 1.2%. But then you look down at the bottom of the table and you can see the bias for the euro in favor of the euro in December with an average change that's positive better than 1.5%. You also see kind of September, October, you've got some strong pattern in favor of the euro, although the amplitudes there don't quite match up to what you see in, in January and December. So this, you know, euro dollar being obviously the most traded currency pair, it's not one where you would think from an, you know, an efficiency sort of perspective that you're going to see strong seasonal or calendar patterns, but yet, you know, here they are. And, and there are these across, you know, not every single pair every single month, but there's enough of them throughout the course of the year that you, you need to want to take them seriously in your own trade. Um, in terms of the day by month, uh, this is just looking at Sterling Aussie as an example of what I saw. You could see on Wednesdays in April, and I have no idea what, what motivates this. I'm not making no claims here, but there is an unusual pattern of two thirds of the time on Wednesdays in April, this cross has been negative and negative in a meaningful enough way that it traded persistently it could, you know, it could pay off. Um, like I said, I don't know why it's a strange one, but you see these these little anomalies throughout the, the day of month pattern. Uh, and sometimes, a lot of times they match up with, with months that are positive for that pair or one side of that pair in any case. And other times they don't. So you know, that's one of those areas of research where maybe somebody will figure it out one day, but it's, so far it's not me. And then the last thing is what I was talking about in terms of looking at the, the week of the year. And here, instead of showing a table, because the table, obviously, with 52 to 53 weeks, the tables are very big. But I, so I've just presented this kind of histogram to give you an idea of what times of the year, and this is dollar yen, are you know are good or bad. And we can see if you look into you know weeks 29 through about 45. So basically, middle of the third quarter, kind of getting into the fourth quarter, um, not. A strong time for dollar yen. Uh, the, you know, either you've got a, a weak dollar pattern or you've got a strong yen pattern in there. Whereas more toward the end of the year and then at the beginning of the year, you see positive uh, for this particular pair. Uh, some of these things you can you can relate probably to say like the Japanese fiscal year uh, being you know on a different calendar, and that's so if you look at weeks 11 through 15. No doubt there's an influence there. You know, there's always the talk about repatriation of yen uh, at the end of March and beginning of April, which which fits into that that weakness section uh, down there. So that's one of those things where you can say, okay, that pretty clearly ties in. And, and what I was looking at before with the, the euro dollar, you can see kind of the year end effects of capital flows and, and corporations having to repatriate or, or whatever uh, with money flowing back and forth. So there is the underlying causality of all this stuff. Um, so just some examples, there's, there's a lot more of these in the report itself. Um, I thought these were ones that at least give you an idea of what you'd see, um, across different pairs and different indices. So the question though, then becomes, well, how do you use this sort of thing? Uh, and it, in my own personal view is there's a, there's a couple of different ways you can do it straight up, which by straight up, I mean, you just you see that there's a pattern there, and you say, okay, we just draw a strong pattern for dollar yen in the the third quarter into the fourth quarter, and so we want to be short dollar yen during that period every year. That's a just simple playing the percentages, which is fine. Uh, my problem with that is there can be a lot of volatility. You know, if you happen to be in the year where things don't go in your favor, you could take a big hit. And so that's something that needs to be accounted for. Um, and even in the years where where it does work out, there can be a lot of volatility within the periods that can be a little bit frightening to to kind of have to ride out. I mean, I've I've traded some of the stuff myself, and and you know you want to be positive and you want to say, okay, I'm playing the percentages and I'm, I'm doing the right thing, but it still gets nervy 
when you know the parents are going against you when things say that it shouldn't be because and you and you can't assume that in any given period that things are going to work out because it, it, there is no 100 percent pattern there is no pattern that's even close to one hundred percent. there are some 70s and 75 percent and things like that which is very good but that still leaves you 25 to 30 percent of the time where it, it's going to go against you so that's why i'm a little bit leery about going with the straight up uh the thing that i think can be quite useful is to use the patterns as a filter. And I'll get to an example of this in a minute. Basically what I mean is, you know, a pattern exists and you've kind of got a trading system that you like, and you use the seasonal pattern as a way of, of filtering trades. For example, it is, you know, you've got a Euro dollar strong in December. You may only want to take long trades from your system or, you know, or, or, you know, or somehow, account for that fact and, and make adjustments in that way. The other thing I think you can do, uh, which is kind of related is you can wait your, you know, use the seasonals to bias your set of your position taking. So if you're in a period where the seasonals are, are working long, but your, your system's giving you a short signal, maybe you take a smaller position than you would otherwise, or maybe you flip it, flip that around. If the seasonals are in your favor, then you, and you, you get a long signal, maybe you, you take a little bit extra risk than you would otherwise. Uh, filtering and, and position weighting are the things that, that make the most sense for me uh, in terms of kind of having a, a good risk profile to your trades. And that's how I personally, when I apply the seasonals, I will tend to, to do things. I'll look, say, okay, what's the pattern for, you know, if there's a pattern, what is the pattern for this particular time period over which I'm looking to trade? And do I see an opportunity to trade in that direction? All other things, you know, being equal. And, you know, if I don't, then okay, whatever. Um, but I will generally avoid trading against the pattern unless I see a really, really good reason to do so. I figure just it's one more thing to put, you know, the advantages in my favor. So I guess to give you an example, uh, here's the equity line of a simple Euro dollar moving average system. It's it's a five day really basic crossover, no filtering, no optimization, no nothing. I just wanted to give you a really simple example. Uh, like I said, the data goes back to ninety seven, and I did this just the other day. So call it the end of March two thousand fourteen, and this system would have lost almost twenty one hundred pips had it been traded this way. Um, if we apply the December January filter to this by saying, okay, we only do longs in December and we only do shorts in January. And other than that, we don't trade. Then we've got a system that over the same time period with the same simple five day moving average crossover produces a net gain at 344 pips. Now it's still, it's a very jagged equity line, a lot of jumps, um, obviously a lot of, lot, you know, you're out of the market for basically 10 months of the year, give or take, depending on what signals you get. And, you know, it's not probably something that you're going to want to use directly this way, but the intent here is to show you that, you know, if you've got, uh, or if you apply a filter using the seasonal, it can improve the performance of systems. Certainly you, you want to go back and back test, and, and there is the problem, you know, with this back testing with these filters and knowing that, you know, the filters are going to have a positive influence. But when you're system testing, you're looking for the best performance in the past anyway. So it's kind of a trade off there. But you get the idea, you know, the, the, the application of the, the seasonals can benefit um, if applied correctly in either a filter or I didn't do a test in the waiting system, but the same sort of thing would apply. So with that, um, I'll, I'll wrap up that discussion and I'll, I'll give you guys a chance to ask me any questions you might have. So feel free to fire away. One of the more interesting ones that I think I found is actually for the month of April was Euro Aussie. On average, loses uh, better than a percent, kind of 1.1, 1 1.1 1 .1 to 1.2% per, per year in the month of August. And the cross has been down about 77% of the time. That's, that's about as high as it gets. Uh, 
that's certainly one of the more striking ones. And and that, the monthly patterns tend to fall in that direction. Um, there are others that I could, uh, you know, I can't rattle them off off the top of my head, but the um, the some of the weekly rolling patterns where you can see just blocks of time where clearly the, the weighting is in one direction or another are, you know, kind of really jump out at you. You go, wow, they, there is stuff that is persistent here. And that's kind of interesting to look at. Just, um, I know we've got a question from Mark about reading the graph and, and Mark, can you clarify that in a little bit, just to give me, give me an idea of, of specifically which graphs um, you're talking about? And I'll get to you, but while, while Mark is clarifying, uh, I'll just rattle off some stuff for April that you guys might find interesting. Uh, Aussie dollar up 63% of the time, about 7 tenths of a percent gain. Cable up 66% of the time, slightly over 1% gain. Dollar Canada down two thirds of the time, loses about two thirds of a percent. Aussie Swiss up 60% of the time, gains about a half a percent. Uh, Euro Aussie, I just mentioned, Euro Canada down about two thirds of the time, loses seven tenths of a percent. And Sterling Swiss down 70, uh, excuse me, up 72% of the time, gains 0.85%. Um, so those are, in terms of April, those are the significant patterns that, um, that come up in the data. All right. Um, um, would you include in as part play? Uh, year in and year out, there there are definitely years where there's something going on in the market which overcomes any sort of seasonal effect. Uh, like I said, there's a lot of seasonality that happens around the end of the year, the beginning of the year, just on, as a natural result of multinational companies doing things balance sheet related and whatnot. But sometimes there's some kind of geopolitical, macro, global event going on that just dominates anything that might be happening on that sort of underlying seasonal basis. And so that's why you do have to be careful about trying to apply the seasonal just uniformly. And that's why I like the idea of using more as a filter and that sort of thing. It's just... Uh, it lets me say, okay, we've got some major stuff going on that, that's probably driving trends differently than the seasonals are going to be able to influence. So I can, you know, I can, or you can, or anybody else can kind of make an adjustment there. All right. So MRC still, um, still just wanted to understand what you mean in terms of reading the graphs, which, which graphs were you referring to? Sterling Aussie. Okay. So if you look across, you've got, I'll just use the, 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 um, the points of April, 136 total observations in the data set. So like I said, it goes back to 1990, 1982. 45 of those, of those weeks, the market was up. So it's one third of the time on average. On those days, the market was up almost seven tenths of 1%. And then on the downside, 91 days out of the count, Mark was down. So it's just over, just over two thirds of the time. On average, we lost over 1%. Um, so uh, all the tables that are in the report are, are outlined in this sort of fashion. So I try to make it, you know, nice and clear and simple. Okay, so do the big institutions not know about such patterns? They must be able to find some, some yeah. I'm sure that the institutions are aware of these patterns. And, and partly that's actually a self-reinforcing mechanism. The, um, the more people who know about it and, and are gonna trade on it are gonna tend to reinforce it. And that's one of the reasons I looked at the, the, the rolling weekly pattern instead of just the monthly ones to see if you kind of capture an effect before a given month. So like before December where people are you know, lining up positions at the end of November, because that's been an issue with seasonal patterns in things you know, like the stock market or in the commodity market where people know the patterns exist. And so they kind of trade in advance of them to try to position. Uh, to MRC, 136 total weeks. Yes. So total number of weeks of April weeks um, with a Wednesday. 
which obviously is you know going to be almost all the the week, April week. Have I considered exploring intraday patterns? Um, to the extent that these weekdays and months and, and weekday patterns are kind of intraday, yes, but uh, not yet. I haven't tried to drill down in terms of, of looking at these kind of broad calendar patterns, partly because, as I said, you know, kind of in explaining them, these patterns are driven by major fundamental. Whereas the weekday patterns are going to be much more driven by what's happening that day, you know, that week in the news cycle um, and that sort of, it just, it's just a normal flow of business sort of thing. So even, even looking at the weekday patterns, you see that the, the patterns are not particularly strong because of the influence of all these other factors that are, are non purely fundamental and not, you know, kind of big capital flows you know, driven by whatever, you know, by the way we are on the calendar. So that's, that's why I haven't kind of drilled down in, in that sort of perspective. Um, so you say in April, Wednesday, it's probably, yeah. So yeah, to, to answer your question, MRC. So in this case, on Wednesdays in April, the, the pattern for Sterling Aussie is biased negatively. So, you know, in theory, you'd want to be at least leaning on the short side. If, you know, as I said, either use it as a filter and say, uh, maybe I only want to take shorts on that day or adjust your weighting in, you know, how you set up your trades so that you maybe you're a little bit weighted toward shorts or, or less weighted on longs, that sort of thing. So that's kind of the idea of what I would, what I would do with this sort of information. Yeah, the euro. Uh, that was actually a monthly pattern. That's that's this one. So that's months. Um, Sarah. So just to repeat again, kind of like looking at the weekly, uh, the weekday data I was just talking about. You had 17 total months, going back to 1997. In the case of January, six of those months were up. 11 months down, so almost a one third, two thirds split. About two and a quarter percent average gain when the when the month was up, about a three percent, three point one percent average loss, and that comes out to on average across all the month, down one point two percent. Well, if you do come up with a question afterwards. Um, that, that I didn't get a chance to answer here. Feel free to send me an email. Um, you can use my email addresses. I'll, I'll actually put it in the discussion here. Um, it's author at the essentials of trading.com. Uh, that's the book that I published with Wiley several years ago. Okay, uh, I want to thank uh, John for his time today and thank you all for attending this presentation. I hope you found this uh, study is interesting and maybe um, you want to you wanna buy the book. So I'm uh, posting a link to it in the chat box. You have there more details about the ebook and you can uh, have access to the, the page to buy it and, and have it, uh, here delivered at your home. Um, I hope you have a beautiful day, a beautiful week. And, uh, I thank you all again for, uh, being on FX Street. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.